servants. Let's, Let's talk, talk about, about that. that. Hey guys, and welcome to this week's Sabbath School Short. My name is Andrew, and this week we're looking at lesson number nine, which is titled To Serve and to Save. And the memory text for this week is found in Isaiah chapter 42, verse 1. It says, Behold my servant whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. And we're going to be focusing on this idea where it says, my servant. And we're going to be looking at three different servants that God used during the time of Isaiah. So let's start by jumping into Sabbath afternoon. The quote that jumped out at me here, it says, Many feel that it would be a great privilege to visit the scenes of Christ's life on earth, to walk where he trod, to look upon the lake beside which he loved to teach, and the hills and valleys on which his eyes so often rested. But we need not go to Nazareth, to Capernaum, or to Bethany in order to walk in the steps of Jesus. We shall find his footprints beside the sickbed, in the hovels of poverty, in the crowded alleys of the great city, and in every place where there are human hearts in need of consolation. In doing as Jesus did when on earth, we shall walk in his steps. That's from Ellen White, The Desire of Ages, page 640. And Sabbath afternoon kind of focuses on the one servant that Isaiah talks about. And as we will unpack this more, we find out that it is very much Jesus Christ. And it's this prophetic um, prophecy that pointed towards Jesus and Jesus fulfilled this prophecy. But that's just one of the servants we're going to be talking about this week. So let's jump into Sunday's lesson, which is titled Servant nation. And the quote that jumped out at me, it says, do not fear for I am with you. Do not be afraid for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my victorious right hand. That's Isaiah chapter 41 verse 10. Here and in the following verses, one of the basic roles of Israel is to trust the true God to save them as King Ahaz did not, rather than to trust in other gods and their images as other nations do. And so this lesson kind of talks about this idea that there's two different kinds of servants that um, Isaiah chapter 41 talks about, and one of them is the corporate, the nation of Israel is one of the servants, and then the other one is a specific individual, which we talked about as Jesus, but we'll talk about that in the next lesson. But these two different um, servants that Isaiah speaks of and the different roles that they have, then we can see that this one is specifically talking about the nation of Israel because it's tied with Jacob. It says Israel and Jacob. And this, the nation had this very specific purpose that God wanted them to be distinct from the rest of the world so that they would not trust in other gods, but they would trust in God himself. And this other servant, this individual servant, which is what Monday's lesson talks about, is described as dying on behalf of sinners. So let's jump down into Monday's lesson, which is titled, Unnamed Individual Servant. And the, the quote that really jumped out at me, it says, We found that this shoot and root of Jesse is the Messiah, the divine child of Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, who also brings peace for the throne of David and his kingdom with justice and with righteousness. The servant in Isaiah 42 is obviously the Messiah. And this shoot and root we looked at a while ago in Isaiah chapter 11, which also was describing Jesus Christ. And this identity of this individual servant found in Isaiah chapter 42, two is none other than Jesus Christ. All these descriptions that the lesson brings out, he provides justice for the nations. He's a teacher. He accomplishes his goals quietly, gently. He serves as a covenant between God and his people. He gives light, hope by healing blindness, liberating prisoners. All of these things that it describes in Isaiah 42 fit none other than Jesus Christ. And also the New Testament um, alludes to this too, actually in Matthew chapter 12, this quote here in the lesson, it says, Matthew chapter 12 quotes from Isaiah 42 and applies it to the quiet healing ministry of Jesus, God's beloved son in whom he delights. It is he whose ministry reestablishes God's covenant connection with his people. So the New Testament also confirms and quotes Isaiah directly in Matthew chapter 12 and applies it to the life of Jesus Christ. So that's our, our first servant was the nation of Israel and how they were supposed to serve God and not other gods and be distinct um, from the rest of the world during their time. And then the second servant, um, obviously, which is the best servant, his name is Jesus Christ, that um, Isaiah alludes to and prophesies about. And then the third um, servant that we find is in Tuesday's lesson, which is titled Persian 
Messiah, and the quote that jumped out at me here, it says, put this prediction into perspective. Since there are about 146 years from the time of Isaiah's death to the fall of Babylon, his prophecy was a century and a half ahead of its time. It would be like George Washington predicting that a man named General Dwight Eisenhower would help liberate Europe in 1945. So there's this crazy um, prophecy found in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 44 um, through 45, that predicts that a man named Cyrus would be the one to conquer Babylon in 539 BC and release the Jews from their Babylonian captivity. And this, as, as the, uh, the quote said, this prediction came so far before the actual event took place and a century and a half ahead of its time. And um, another quote from this, from Tuesday's lesson that jumped out at me, it says, by predicting Cyrus, God proved his unique divinity by demonstrating that he alone knows the future. And I think this is a beautiful hope that we can all have, um, knowing that we can see these prophecies in the Bible actually take place and be fulfilled like to the letter. Um, that what God says and what God says through his prophets and what God says in prophecy is true and it will happen. And that gives us a lot of hope to know because as we read Revelation, it says that we hold the victory as believers in Jesus Christ. And we can hold on to that as a fact, as truth in our day and look forward to that moment with hope and great expectation that no matter what happens, we are going to be victorious. And even if we die, we will be risen again um, and be caught up in the clouds with Jesus. And I cannot wait for that time. But this this Cyrus, how he was anointed, um, it says in Isaiah chapter 45, for this purpose um, of liberating the people, serves as he is that third servant, which is also interesting because he wasn't, uh, the lesson brings out that he's not um, an Israelite king, he's not from that nation. God used a, a foreigner from the people of the Jews to liberate them and uses him as this servant, which is um, another really cool thing. So jumping over into Wednesday's lesson, which is titled Hope in Advance. And the quote that jumped out at me, it says, Isaiah's basic message is consistent throughout his book. Trust the true God, including his messianic deliverer, rather than other powers. And this is kind of elaborating on the fact that some people are very uncomfortable with the idea that there were prophets that could predict the future um, and God revealed them to that. It's very a lot of um, people who don't believe in those things. And those people have tried to, to kind of make this fit by saying there was actually a second Isaiah um, that wrote the second half of the book and he was living during the time of Cyrus. And so he was able to write his name because he saw it actually take place, but he wrote it down as a prophecy. Um, but there is actually no historical evidence that that is true. In fact, in the, in the earliest manuscripts that we have, there's absolutely no kind of a break or no kind of um, evidence that would suggest that there was a different author. And if there was a second Isaiah, you would think that somewhere in the Bible he would be mentioned um, because of his significance in this book and in these prophecies that are written about Jesus. Um, but he's nowhere mentioned as a second Isaiah. It's all just one Isaiah. So there's not really any any kind of evidence that suggests this second Isaiah. And you kind of see this common theme throughout the whole book, and it's very clear that Isaiah wrote this whole thing um, himself, and God was giving it to this Isaiah way before the time of Cyrus. And now is the time um, to trust in the true God and not other powers, and that's the kind of common theme that runs throughout this book. So jumping over to Thursday, it's a lesson which is titled, A Feeling and suffering servant. Looking at Isaiah chapter 49 verses 1 through 12 and the quote that that jumped out at me here it says there is plenty of overlap between this description and that of Isaiah 42 where we identify the servant as the Messiah. The New Testament finds the servant's attributes in Jesus Christ in both comings. And this is where it kind of starts to introduce this idea of the suffering servant, which next week we're really going to unpack this because it's a beautiful part of Isaiah's prophecy and it's a beautiful part of scripture of how Jesus fulfilled these prophecies that Isaiah had so long ago. And the fact that Jesus is our salvation, he's taking our scars, our iniquities and placed it upon himself and died on the cross so that we can be free in his name. And that is such good news. And it gave, I imagine that it gave the people during the time of Isaiah so much hope and so much um, freedom to know 
that God was still looking out for them and that God was still planning a way for them to be liberated. Um, and it probably gave them so much hope during that time. So a feeling and suffering servant, we're going to pack that a lot more next week. So stay tuned for that because it's a beautiful part of scripture. And then jumping over to Friday section to further thought. Um, the quote that jumped out at me, it says, The Savior never suppressed the truth, but he uttered it always in love. In his dealings with others, he exercised the greatest tact, and he was always kind and thoughtful. He was never rude, never needlessly spoke a severe word, never gave unnecessary pain to a sensitive soul. He did not censure human weakness. He fearlessly denounced hypocrisy, unbelief, and iniquity. But tears were in his voice as he uttered his scathing rebukes. He never made truth cruel, but ever manifested a deep tenderness for humanity. And that's Ellen White, Gospel Workers, page 117. And this fact that Jesus ultimately is the greatest servant to ever walk the earth. Um, out of these three servants, Jesus Christ is the one who brought us today freedom, liberation from the power of sin because of his death. And kind of summarizing this up, this other quote here at the end, that's kind of the summary of this whole lesson. It says, deliverance requires a deliverer. God's servant nation would be delivered by two deliverers, Cyrus, who would set the captives free from Babylonian exile, and an unnamed servant, whose identity as the Messiah is progressively revealed. This servant would restore justice and bring the community of survivors back to God. So we can rest in that hope today that Jesus Christ is our deliverer, and he is bringing us back to God as we come to him, and he cleanses us with his blood, and we are free in his name. So I hope you guys enjoyed this week's Sabbath School Short while looking at these three different servants um, found in the book of Isaiah. If you could always leave a thumbs up for this video, that would be great. Drop down in the comments below. We would love to have a conversation with you. How do you think Jesus is still serving you today? As Jesus was a servant um, when he came to this earth, he's up in heaven now, right? But he's still reaching out and speaking to us. In what ways have you seen Jesus working and moving in your life as a servant? would and blessing you and serving you. We'd love to have a conversation with you. Subscribe to Advent Blueprint for future episodes. We are super excited to see you here next week on Sabbath School Short. We'll see you then.